you do. Um, first thing you may have noticed on Canvas or the website, I'm going to push back that proposal to Friday the 20th. So a week from Friday, the proposal will be due. And then I'll like have a look at them over that weekend and give you, to give you some feedback. Um, so it gives you a little more time to, uh, number one, come chat with me, or some of you also asking questions on Piazza, and I can give some, uh, or via email. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I, I highly recommend coming chatting with me. Like the f first several people that I've, first few people that I've talked to, um, I think it's, it was really good to help um, direct at least what, what initial investigations you might be doing. And, and another thing to point out is that uh, it's a proposal, and it doesn't mean you're stuck with that. So if I deem it too big and too complex or too minimal at the proposal stage, you, you know, you can change uh, at that point um, an update or whatever needs to be done. So it doesn't have to be perfect in terms of getting, getting things right in terms of your project scope and, and uh, its relation to the class. I'll, I'll help you with that through the comments to your proposal. Any, any questions there on, on the project proposal? <clears throat> and I want you to upload a PDF to Canvas. Okay, and I'll um, do inline comments and things and send it back to you, Chris. Yeah, I'm not uh, too uh, particular on that. Um, I've got these, uh, you know, what, what you'll be graded on, and then a little bit of information here to. Uh, give you an idea, right? So definitely you need to talk about your motivation, your how the system works, the literature search, right? Some kind of relative literature, and then how you might hope to use what we're going to learn in this class to investigate that. And in particular, maybe I didn't I stated that super, I mean, this motivation for the problem, you know, it needs to be like, well, what do you want to solve? What are you asking about that system, right? I want to know why um, the um, <clears throat> why 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 can a person only jump so far right that might be a, a clear question to investigate and um, and then you could model a person and maybe try to make them jump and and through simulation analysis understand some some of the physical limitations that prevent us from jumping uh, that, that would be particularly one, but think about um, a research type of question, um, preferably something that is not already known. I think that might give you a, a, mo a more thorough uh, experience. But <clears throat> if you, um, another way to approach it too is like if there's an existing system that somebody else solved, like some kind of real problem on some machine, and and you read about the solution to it, um, it's reasonable to try to replicate things too. So replicating um, analyses from other dynamics papers is, um, is worthy too, right? But it can't be, um, you know, fully spelled out for you. Like, I, you know, it's got to, you got to be able to, it's got to be some material there that you've got to come up with your own and generate. But uh, replicating other things is often um, quite challenging uh, too and uh, sort of worthy. All the questions on that? All right, so a little bit more time there. And just for a little inspiration, I uh, waste too much time checking Reddit every morning. Um, this uh, popped up on my feed today. And I don't know why the big Reddit guy. Here we go. We get it full screen. And I think if the little sound is this. Oops, no, that's not it. Uh, this is... The guy that said he won practice yo-yoing for several years and then won the yo-yoing championship. So uh, I don't know if there's any... Is the sound not coming to you? Huh. Sound's plugged in. Don't 
don't know why. Well, you don't have to see the sound, but anyways. <clears throat> so this guy's got some cool yo-yo moves. <clears throat> the yo-yo is an interesting dynamic system. And uh, I suspect that um, picking some move out of there could be an interesting uh, problem to solve, right? So you have a yo-yo and a string, and you, and you want to see like what, what his hands had to do to maybe make a particular yo-yo mo mo uh, -yo motion. So anyways, I thought that was a cool uh, dynamic thing that just popped up uh, this morning for me. And uh, it's pretty remarkable what humans can train themselves to do. And, and in fact, this is sort of a, you know, this is a human interacting with a, a, mul a multi-body system, essentially, and, uh, and how they're able to manipulate it to do very complex things. That was one of the remarkable skills of our species. Um, and the other thing, speaking of Reddit, to get other ideas, I love the mechanical GIFs subreddit. If you've never checked this out, um, it has an endless supply. Um, if I, for example, I'm going to click the top ones of all time and, uh, you know, just clicking some of these things are, are quite interesting. Um, you find like this, this would be a very interesting convex, complex shape that you know creates a weird gear. Um, we'd probably want something more 3D for this class project, but you can get interesting. And I guess you can't fast forward GIFs, so if they're long, I'm gonna skip that one. See if there's another fun. Um, oh yeah, like uh, different kinds of. Um, Articulated machines, like these are definitely good uh, things. Um, other fun multi-body, you know, systems. Maybe you can make a 3D one of that or something. Um, here's a, a rotary, rotary engine, you know, that has a number of bodies uh, working together. And, um, oh yeah, definitely any of Boston Dynamics stuff, right? This is, uh, these guys create some, some of the most impressive robots in the world, probably the most impressive robots in the world. And uh, all of their robots, um, you know, have multi-body dynamic models. So that could be fun to make. Like that's sort of like a se segue type of thing, except that you've got the flexible legs that can make it jump. Um, that's something that's attainable in this class, I think, to you know, make a robot jump like that or something. Uh, the control stuff is a little, if, I would say, so one thing is if, if you've had controls, some controls, you know, you can add that in. Uh, but when you make your proposal, if you don't have those, you might want to stick to a passive analysis of some mechanical system. But uh, if you have some control background already, you know, you, you could you can probably control some of these things too. Okay, so... Mechanical GIFs Reddit is a nice source of... Oh, yeah, and one more I want to show you is I used to skateboard. Here, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Um, uh, because I'm old and I break much easier. I do skateboard. Actually, I, I do go to the skate park near my house some to get a little exercise. But, uh, oh yeah, here's a... Here's a picture of me in my heyday, right, doing some kind of big jump on a ramp. This jump is called an ollie, if, you, if you've never heard of it. And uh, the most basic form of the ollie is, uh, so this is a guy, sort of an amateur, uh, making the board pop off the ground. And so this was invented in the um, 70s by a guy named... Um, Darn, his name is not, it's on the tip of my tongue. But anyways, uh, it revolutionized skateboarding when this trick was invented, right? How to get the board off the ground. Before that, all you did was sway around and carve 
in the early skateboarding days. But when this was invented, it like changed everything. And this, I don't think anybody's made a nice multi-body dynamics model of to show how, how the heck do you pop the board and get it up in the air. And even my, uh, uh, the professor that used to teach this class, Mont Hubbard, he's emeritus right now, he was my PI here. And he thought he knew how it happened, and he was, he was wrong. And, uh, and so you might be surprised at what, what has to sort of happen to make that work. And I think it would be a fun, very nice little multi-body dynamics problem. So if you're having trouble with ideas, I can happily give you some ideas. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say there. Any questions? Any questions on that and any other things? And then uh, let's go to the notes and things. And I wanted to fix the page size here. Paper size. Uh, seven, 17 by 11. Stop making noises. Okay, so if you recall, uh, last, the last thing we talked about was this. So we were investigating this system here, this plane that has point O, point P1, and point P2 in it. Um, the plane is rotating at a constant rate here, omega, and it has point P1, can move around in the plane. It's described by Q1 and Q2, time varying variables. P1 um, is then, and then P2 uh, also moves around in the plane, but L is a, non, is a constant, right? It's not non-time varying variable, and um, it moves in a particular fashion related to Q3, relative to P1. Okay, so P1 and P2 move. The last thing that we did, we were trying to figure out, well, what's the velocity of P1 in the A-frame? And the A-frame is the inertial reference frame here, um, or in this, the uh, background frame. And the last thing we came up with is that um, the, velo the velocity, right, we wrote our um, relationship here that allows us to do maybe some easier velocity calculations, and we found that the velocity of P1 and B is simply Q dot BX plus Q2, Q1 dot BX plus Q2 dot BY. And then we have this cross product. If we know omega of B and A crossed with P1, the vector P1, which is O to P1, we can form that cross product and figure out the rest of our velocity. And if you, if you do that, you know, we have a constant omega, simple rotation about by is omega b and a crossed with this vec this other vector, p this not other vector, but the vector p1, which is just q1 bx, q2 by. And if you do that cross product, right, that's by is pointing up. And if I cross it into um, this vector, p1, then I'm going to get some, vo some velocity that's in the negative bz direction. So that simply reduces to negative omega q1 bz. So that's where we're at. We have the velocity of p1. And we'd also like to find the velocity of p2. And then we're, we started talking about acceleration. I gave you the 
the definition of that, we want to figure out well, what, al what also are the accelerations of these points in the A-frame. Okay? Any questions there on that reminder? Does everybody understand? This, this is what you guys were working on at the end of the class that um, didn't seem that it was necessarily that obvious. So, any questions on how that last bit, well, how the whole thing works out? We also right, talk, talked about why these go away. Okay, <clears throat> so let's then uh, move on to, actually how do I get there, I want to go to today, and then I'm going to, I'll bring that image back in here so that we can continue to remember what it looks like. Um, this one. So, the next thing that we want to do, we, we now have this expression for the velocity of P1 and A. And um, as a reminder, we can, we have that expressed though in the B frame. So the velocity of P1 in A equals Q1 dot Bx plus Q2 dot By minus omega q1 um, b z. All right, so that's expressed in the b frame. Um, we can also express that same vector in the other reference frames that are available. Uh, for example, um, Right, the E frame is, de is defined by E X E Y E Z, and if you recall, um, actually take take a few minutes, talk to your neighbor if you need, but it, write that vector in the E frame. All right, so um, yeah, let me increase. Let me do a little more here. And then, uh, so the E frame, this is E X, E Z, and E Y, right? And then there's this, this is Q3, that's that angle between the B frame and the E frame. So try to try to write um, that vector there in expressed in the E frame.
many people got something? So uh, compare your notes with your partner and see if you got the same thing, or with your neighbor, see if you got the same result. Got something? is not needed for this, right? Because you have you have a vector expressed in B, and you want it expressed in, a, in E, and there's some orientation or relationship between B and E. So I don't think you need A, but um, direction cosine matrix would certainly help, for sure. All right, what's the answer here? Somebody give me an answer. I saw a few correct ones. Anybody brave enough? I'll give it a shot. Yep, so Josh um, on the floor. Raise your hand if you agree on that. Yeah? All right. What's the, what's the next one? Who got that? Anybody else get the same? All right. Looking good. And lastly? Uh, easy. Same, same vector, right? We're rotating around easy, easy. 
Easy beasy. Um, so once you have those, you plug them in. And uh, Q1 dot times C3 EX minus S3 EY uh, plus Q2 dot BY is um, S3 EX sine 3 EX cosine Q3 EY and then minus omega Q1 EZ. Right? So you can draw the little sketch to figure out that uh, these relationships between these two univectors and, and express them each of the unit vectors in, in the other frame and then plug them in and if you want to expand that out you know you could write it as a measure number times EX, measure number times EY and a measure number times EZ um, but I'll let you do that for your own fun there okay so we can express any any vector in any other reference frame okay so what if we want now the velocity of P2 in A Right, that's the time derivative of the, the, uh, the vector that I called P2. P2 is from O to P2 in A. And we have a, um, a useful formula. We could uh, oops. we could then write this as um, the time derivative of P1 in A plus the time derivative of um, I'll call it P2 minus P1 in A. So if I know the velocity of P1 and I add the velocity of P2 relative to um, P1, then I could get the total velocity there. Well, this is just the velocity of P1 in A. And then this vector, P2 minus P1, is simply Lex, right? And L is fixed. Uh, well, L is, uh, doesn't change in B. And I write exactly what I want here. So we can write this as L E X, right? DT. And The time derivative of Lex dt in A, right? We have some time derivative in, in A. Um, we know that that can be then written as the time derivative of Lex dt. Um, I'm confusing myself. I think I want to say that the uh, time derivative of Lex, so L is fixed in the E frame, is one key thing. So if L is fixed in the E frame, then this could be expanded to the uh, time derivative of Lex in the E frame, dt plus omega of E and A crossed with LEX, right? What is the middle term equal to? The time derivative of LEX hat dt? Yeah, if I'm standing in the E frame, um, at P, uh, the vector from P1 to P2 would not be moving. So then we have um, that uh, V P2 
and A equals V P1 and A, which we are already have figured out, plus omega of E and A crossed with L E X, right? In omega of E and A, we can use our addition of, omega, of omegas, right? So if I want to know omega of E and A, what is that going to be? How can I use auxiliary reference frames here and write out some simpler omegas? So the addition, that addition of a of a angular velocity theorem. Recall how that works. So if we have A reference frame A and reference frame B and reference frame E, they all have simple rotations. So we could probably write, if you remember the addition theorem, we may be able to write omega of E and A relatively simply because of those simple rotations. Any idea, Chris? And those are what? Omega of B and A? Omega, and what's the unit vector? PY plus what is omega of E and B? Is omega of E and B a simple rotation? Rotates to Q3, and Q3 is a time varying variable. So, what axis does it rotate about? EZ. What would be the magnitude of that simple rotation? Q3 dot. So there's my uh, omega e of E and A. And if I cross that, right, omega of E and A crossed with L E X equals omega B Y plus Q dot 3 E Z crossed with L E X. B Y crossed with E X. Is, is what would be what direction? By crossed with ex. Right hand, right hand rule. Negative ez. So then we would get for that first term, omega, negative omega ez plus what's ez crossed with ex. EY. So then we get Q3 dot L. We got the L here too, right? L E Y. So now we have the velocity of P1 and A plus this, this term got us, you know, which is this. We add that to what we have there, and we've got the velocity of P2 in A. Questions there? How we, how we got that? So this is our... Uh, we knew that if we knew the velocity of P1, we can just add the velocity of P2 minus P1 to it, and then we converted P2. That, that vector we wrote out using our nice formula there. That makes helps simplify things. Okay. And then you could also express that in um, 
you know, whatever reference frame you want. Right now we have it all in the E's. You could, you could re-express it in the B or the A frame, you know, depending on uh, what use you need it there. Anybody not got this sheet? Okay. So, this, um, I like how when, I, when you write math, that then OneNote tries to make a title for you. It's all this weird, these weird sayings. Um, this leads us to think about then some interesting, an interesting topic, right? What if I have two points on the same reference frame? A rigid body. So two points fixed on the same rigid body. Um, how are these? How are the velocities related? So, in in that previous example, let me get the figure back up again. If it'll let me. What um, what reference frame are the points P1 and P2 fixed in relative to each other? fixed with respect to each other if you view from reference frame A. Reference frame B. So if I'm standing on B, I, maybe I'm standing at O, and I'm looking at P1. Well, P1's moving with Q1 and Q2 dot in B. And also, if I look at it at P2, well, it's, it's moving too, um, but not in the same direction as P1 necessarily because Q3. So if I'm standing in B, they're not fixed with respect to each other. That only leaves E then. Are they fixed if I'm standing in E relative to each other? If I stand on P1, look at P2, and I'm in E, is P2 moving relative to P1? No. So that's a key thing, right? Um, these two are fixed with respect to each other and um, in the E frame. So in general, um, this, is, this provides us with a nice tool. So given a reference frame A and two points fixed in a body B, Um, with angular velocity, omega of B and A, with P and Q, um, the position vectors from O which is fixed in A, um, to points P and Q respectively, and that um, the vector P equals the vector Q plus some vector R, so that R is a vector from Q to P. 
And in, in a picture form, if I have some rigid body, and this may be the fir first time in this class I've drawn the rigid body potato. This is our favorite rigid body type in dynamics. Um, if I have a point here, O, that's fixed in the reference frame A, which is the sort of background here, and then I have two points on the body, P and Q, where we have vector P, vector Q. And R is, uh, P is Q plus R. So R is that. So that's the system we're describing. And R doesn't change when you're standing on B, right? These two points are glued onto the rigid body. If you think about what we just sort of discovered on our own, and you can look back at those equations, that the velocity of P and A can then be described as the velocity of Q in A plus omega of B in A crossed with R. And let me, uh, okay. <clears throat> this, and remember that, just to note, R is fixed in B. Okay, so that, that's the formula that we just sort of derived ourselves right before because we knew that um, the two points there are fixed in the E-frame. So if you replace everything in here, we could just use this, this theorem. And this is called the uh, velocity two points on a rigid body theorem, or the two-point theorem. So, um, And this is extremely useful for figuring out velocities, right? We don't have to go, go through exactly what we just did, but we can make this, uh, just use this as stated, right? Questions there on that? And if you look at our previous notebook there, you, you see that we essentially have that, right? The velocity of P1 and A plus omega of E and A crossed with, in this case, the vector R. And I guess I need some way to point, right? So this is the R vector, right? It's fixed in E. And we get omega of E and A. And then the velocity of P1 and A is that first portion. So this is, this is what we came up with is the formal, um, this is more the formal way to sort of state that relationship that's always holds true. Everybody got this? Anybody not have this one? So um, there's a corollary to to acceleration, right? If I have the acceleration of P and A for that same system I just drew, then that's going to be the time derivative of the velocity of P and A in A. And we can now write that, this term out, as the time derivative of the velocity of Q in A, right? And then that second portion is then going to be the time derivative of A times omega B of A crossed R. Okay, so if I take the time derivative of that expression I just showed you, the, that form of the two-point theorem, we get this, and now we can expand this out. And that ends up looking like, so this first term, right, that's just the acceleration of Q and A. So we have the acceleration of Q and A. The first term's pretty easy, but then we gotta do this derivative of the cross product, so we need to use the product rule and we're going to get 
d omega of b in a, in a dt, crossed with r, plus omega of b in a, times the time derivative of r with respect to t in a. Okay? And this is a cross. So we use the product rule for that last term. And then if we, we can now write the, these out a little simpler. So we still have the acceleration, and I'm forgetting, yep, acceleration of Q and A plus time derivative of omega of B and A in A. What is that? Angular acceleration. So we can just write it more simply. Same angular acceleration of B and A crossed with R plus here we have omega of B and A crossed with R dt and R is changing with respect to time but we can write that out then R remember is so R is fixed in B. So it turns out that we only need omega of B crossed R there. So this is the acceleration two-point theorem. If I know the acceleration of Q and A, right, one, if I know the acceleration of some point Q that's on this body B, then all I have to do is add alpha of B and A crossed R, which is that's the vector that's fixed in B, plus this triple cross product, I mean double cross product, um, omega B and A crossed with omega B and A crossed R. And those you know, getting these is easier than doing out the, the big derivative. Um, so what are these terms? What is this, does this term remind you of anything? Alpha r, alpha times r, basically. So maybe acceleration times r. If you had a point on a spinning disk, what is alpha times r? It's a linear velocity of that point, but what um, a linear acceleration of that point? But what is there a specific type of acceleration that that is? Alpha times r. I hear something. Tangent direction, right? So this is the tangential component. And then what, what must this be? If you think of a 2D thing, omega squared times r. What does that remind you of? Radial or centripetal, right? So radial, oops. All right, so those are those two components that pop out, right? <clears throat> so we get the velocity of that point Q and R, Q and A, of this fixed point at this point of B, and then we just need to add the tangential acceleration and the radial acceleration components to that to get, get the full thing. There. Okay, so these are the um, two-point theorems, and they're very useful. What time are we at? Um, 52. Uh, let's let's break.
and then I'll come back and I'll show you how these work out in, in Autolev. But as a new thing to do over your break, if you go to tinyurl.com and then mae223 dash feedback, I'm going to try to start doing this in the middle. There's two quick questions. You can give me like a sentence that says uh, one positive aspect about something you understand or you like in the, in, the, in the lecture, and then the other one a negative, like something you don't understand or something that I'm not doing good. Write those in. It's anonymous. I read them really quickly and then and adjust. Okay? So go to that, and during the five-minute break here, come back in uh, at 10.57, 10.58. Um, you can give me a quick, quick note. Well, I guess you don't, if it's anonymous, you shouldn't raise your hand. But uh, I'll give uh, one, one more one more chance to press enter. Okay, good feedback. Um, one was to try to explicitly state the theorems that are being applied in each of the steps. Another, more example problems from the homeworks. I will, uh, let's, um, in fact, in, let's do one quick example. Speaking of that before we jump over to showing you the simpy thing. And then uh, you like the dynamics potato and you really enjoy taking derivatives of vectors. So good feedback there. Thank you. All right, so yeah, if you guys can do that for me in, in the breaks, we'll try to do that each time and, and that'll help, uh, I think, help a lot. Okay? So let's look at a little example here. Some reference frame A. And simple uh, merry-go-round again. If I can draw a decent circle. I can use this, try to use the circle tool. If I can get used to these circle. There we go. Okay, and this circle is body B, and we have a point Q and a point P. P's on the edge, Q's in the center, and this thing is moving at a constant angular velocity omega. Well, actually, not constant. I meant to just write its um, sum time varying potentially omega of b and a and right if we draw a vector from here to here we can call that vector r and p and q are both fixed in b right and we can relatively easily deduce the um, velocity of P in A, right, equals omega of B in A crossed with R. The velocity of Q in A, what does that equal? It's at zero. It's the center of the disk. It's not moving in A. And that also implies that the acceleration of Q and A is equal to zero. Right? But what if we want the acceleration of P and A? Then we can use this theorem 
up above, right? Acceleration of Q and A plus alpha of B and A crossed with R. So I have the same notation here. Plus this omega B and A. So we know that this, is, this one is zero. So we only have to determine these last two bits. My omega of B and A disappeared here. So um, this is the tangential acceleration. It is whatever the time derivative of omega B and A is crossed with that R vector. And then this portion, so we just leave that. We don't have any more information. Omega B crossed with R. What direction would omega B and A crossed with R be? So omega b is pointing out of the board, right-hand rule. And so then if I cross in the r, going up, right? So b is sticking out. Omega b and a is sticking out, crossed in the r. That's this term. So we ha we have this portion is a is a vector that's pointing up. And then if I do the second cross product, omega of b and a crossed with that vector, omega b and a sticking out, cross it in, this vector pointing up, then I get a vector pointing this direction. So th this whole thing is then going to be pointing in that direction in the negative um, a x, for example. And if uh, if omega is constant, then that would just reduce to negative r omega squared right. So that's our centripetal acceleration. So if I did move this thing in a constant speed, I still am going to have that acceleration term. And if, if, if omega is constant, this would go away. So <clears throat> a little confusing here. This um, really not adding anything to the picture with that line, so I'll erase that. But uh, if omega of a, a constant, if omega is constant, then alpha B and A goes to zero. And the last portion there is the centripetal acceleration. So we still have that even though omega is constant. OK. A little simple, relatively simple example. Oh, now I got five responses. Good. All right, slow down and simpy. Another good feedback. So let's, if you want to open up simpy and follow along, let's try to um, see how it can help us with those theorems. Give you a minute to copy these first lines. So our standard import SymPy, import the mechanics module, and I turned on some late the LaTeX printing. And then um, I get Q1, Q2, and Q3 are the dynamic symbols. And L is the um, 
length, the distance between P1 and P2 from that example we were looking at earlier. So L, we've got Q1, Q2, and Q3, and we also need omega, which is a constant, which I forgot. So modify, we need omega here. I'll just use W and omega. <coughs> Those are all the variables there. And we had a few reference frames. We have reference frame A, reference frame B. There is a way to, there's no function, there's no functionality to like pass in a collection of uh, rotations and create them all at once, per se not the auxiliary ones, for example. But the orient command, we'll get into this later, the orient command has a lot of options to do complex rotations in one, one go. And it skips all the auxiliaries. But we're going to work, we'll just do auxiliaries from now, um, so far. So we want to get all these reference frames and, start, and go ahead and orient them relatively to each other. So if we recall that B oriented to A, if I look back at the picture here, is about by through omega t, the angle omega t. So that means I also need t up here. I'm forgetting all. So be sure to add. We got um, time varying variables q1, q2, and q3, and then um, constants l. Um, uh, L, omega, and T we'll use. Okay? So then I orient A about an axis through the angle omega times T about the uh, B, I mean, sorry, the A dot Y. And this is supposed to be And then if I look at its DCM with respect to A, should get what you would expect there. Can um, you all then orient B, C, um, sorry, I got, there was no C, it's E. Can you orient um, E relative to B? So orient E relative to B. Okay, so I did the first one. Simple rotation about BY through omega T. And then Yeah, um, rename it to E. I made a mistake there. You bought a laptop. Well, I'm not, uh, hopefully my class didn't force you to spend a thousand dollars. school without a laptop until the last couple of years. 
and then I bought one, and I haven't turned back. But now I find myself laptoping in every possible situation in life, which is good and bad, I guess. Raise your hand if you don't have that orientation. Seems like everybody's got it. So <clears throat> E is ro rotated to relative to B through Q3 about E about easy BZ, which I've already we've already said easy BZ. So if I do um, E dot orient re respect to B about a simple axis through Q3, and then I do uh, B dot Z. Is that what everybody got? And then E, D, C, M, B. We wrote those out. You had to write that out in class for um, earlier. And then I can also do E, D, C, M, A. And it'll give me the rotation matrix between through those that auxiliary reference frame, essentially. Okay, so there's some new things here. Uh, we have in the figure, uh, points O, P1, and P2. And we want to talk about the velocities of those points and the positions and the accelerations. So we have a point object. I can create a point O equals me dot point, name it O. And then same thing with uh, P1, me dot point, P1, and P2. And much like the reference frames, um, we, you know, we orient reference frames relative to other reference frames. And here we're going to um, set the position of a point relative to another reference frame. So P1 dot set position. If I look at its help file, it says that we need to give it another point, which is the point's location defined relative to the point you pass, and then the vector, which is that that relationship. And there's some examples there, too. So then I can do set position relative to O. And do you recall what the uh, position from O to P1 was? Q1 times Bx plus Q2 times By, right? And then um, P2, we can set its position relative to P2. is maybe a little more convenient. What is that? A vector from P1 to P2. Oh, I'm sorry. This is supposed to be P1. Lex, L times E dot X. So once you set those positions, then you can call position from O. It'll return that vector. And then I can even do P2 position from O. And that gives me the full vector, right? So notice that it's expressed in B and E. Um, you can easily re-express things. Position from O, and then dot. This is a vector, so I can call dot express in A if I want. Oops. Spelled express wrong. Let's start with express in um, B. Right? And it'll use those direction cosine matrices and properly re-express the vector. And then I can do the same thing. P2 dot position from O. 
and I could even express it in the A frame, right? And I get a light, nice longer vector there. So that's pretty convenient. Well, what about the velocities and, and such? Um, we had this uh, two point theorem, and if you check a given point, um, P2, and I hit tab, notice that um, there's a bunch of different functions associated with it, but one of them is V2 point theory. So this says it sets the velocity of this point using the two-point theory. And that's the velocity of P and N equals the velocity of um, O and N plus omega B and N cross the, the, the vector from O to P. That's what that says. It takes an, another, so what does it take here? You have to give it three things. And the first thing is the first point, O, So this would be, if I have some given point that I want to give it, I want to pass in this other point that is on the same body, right, that we know the velocity of already. And then the outer, outer frame is the reference frame we want this point's velocity defined in. In our case, we've been trying to get the velocity defined in A in that problem. And then finally, the frame that these points share, right, the ones that are fixed in, the body, Okay, so if you pass those in, we can use the two-point theorem relatively easy to get um, velocities. So the first thing, let's set P1 set velocity. This one's relatively easy. You give it a frame and a value. So I want to set the velocity of P1 in N, I'm sorry, in A, to a vector. And what was the velocity of P1 in A. We worked that out at the end of the last class. Wasn't too too bad. So we can write write that out. Um, let's just is that what I want to do? Do I want to write it out? Or the velocity of P1. Yeah, let's just write it out. So dot diff with respect to T times B dot X plus Q2 derivative with respect to T times B dot Y minus omega times q1 times b dot z. Is that right? And once I set a velocity, I can ask for that velocity. Um, I think yeah, I wanted to show well, we'll just go with this. this is exactly what I wanted to do, but I can say then velocity if I look at what velocity is, it says if I ask for the velocity in a particular frame, it'll give me that. So then if I call velocity in A, it should return what I just typed in. Okay? So that's the velocity of P1 in A. Now, <clears throat> we, we know about this V2 point theory. So if I do um, P2, V2 point theory, and just to remind you, it takes the other point that's in, fixed in the body, the frame that you want the velocity to express, be expressed in, and then the frame that the two points share. So what's the other point that, they, that, are, fixed, that are fixed into the frame E? So first we give it P1, which we know the velocity of because we just, we just set it. And what frame do we want the velocity with respect to A. And then finally, what frame does P1 and P2 share or are fixed in? 
E. So if I call that now, we should see something familiar. Um, it takes the velocity of P1, and then it computes that omega crossed R term, right, where we have L E's X was the uh, term, and then um, we crossed it with omega of A and E. So if we, let's double check that. If we look at what omega of A and E is, right, we can say um, E dot angular velocity in A, right? So that's the angular velocity of E and A. And once we we would cross that in with cross that with this vector between P2 and P1. So if I do E dot angvel in A, and I'll use M E dot cross, right? We do the cross product of the first term crossed with how how would you type how would you get the um, position vector between P from P one to P two? Right, that's what we need to cross it there. We could type it explicitly, but we've already typed it. Can we um, can we just access it instead of having to type it again using the uh, methods that I showed you about the points a little higher up? P two dot position from P one. Right, that would return that vector that we've already specified. And if I do that cross product, that should be equivalent to the cross product here. The B, so the V2 point theory does this behind the scenes for you. And we can verify then that that's correct. And it also adds in the velocity of P1 and A. Velocity of P1 and A are the first three terms. The last two terms are omega of E in A crossed with the vector from P1 to P2. Right, so the V2 point theory does that for you. And the A2, the A acceleration is even more annoying to do by hand. So if I look at uh, P2 dot A2 point theory, and check that out. It basically takes the exact same notation as V2 point theory, and it will calculate using the this formula that we derived and take those cross products for us. So then I can um, do P2 dot A2 point theory. And then I give it the exact same arguments as A and E. One thing to note is that we have not explicitly calculated the acceleration of P1 and A, which this, would, this, would, this needs. Um, that acceleration will be, if, it's, if it hasn't been set to a value, uh, Simpy Mechanics will try to uh, take that derivative for you. Right? So for example, before I type that in, if I asked for P2 dot, um, notice there's a, no, to P1, we need P1 dot set ACC, so I could accept the acceleration vector of P2 in some reference frame with this, but we haven't done that. And, uh, and that's okay, because if I ask for that acceleration, P, the um, acceleration of P1 in A, it'll calculate it for me, right? So it, it did a calculation there. I didn't have to do this by hand. And we could have done that up here, too, to get the, to set that velocity. It'll help calculate these things for you, but we just set that one explicitly. This one 
it calculated for us. I didn't have to do those derivatives. So now, right, I have the pieces of the puzzle there to call the two-point acceleration theorem. And there it is. You know, you get a pretty nasty, long-looking expression. And if I express that in the A-frame, that's what it looks like. So we've got a relative, you know, we just have one point, two points, and like two, ref two extra reference frames, and all of a sudden our acceleration gets, you know, horrendous. And you can imagine having to, to do these by hand, you, can, you certainly can do them, but I, I avoid that in my life these days. And, um, you know, if you want to practice taking your derivatives by hand, you can, um, but this is a very useful thing, right, to save some time and energy. Any questions on that? So those are the, that's how we talked about this eight, these V2 point, the velocity 2 point theorem and the eight acceleration 2 point theorem. And they're convenient ways to calculate the acceleration of points if you know that two points are fixed in any body. And if you happen to know information about one, it's, it's relatively easy to get the information about the other one. <clears throat> okay? Questions? One thing, one one thing I wanted to just say. Um, P two. Let's look at P one dot ACC and A. Right, we calculated that. It's expressed in B. One thing I forgot to mention here is that. We recognize any of these components. Bx, right, that's pointing, um, look at the figure so we remember. Bx is this direction. And so we have this term that's q1 double dot, right, it's acceler this uh, point p1 is accelerating the Bx. But it also has this negative omega squared Q1, which is in, in that direction. So what is, it's probably, it should be obvious what that is, right? This is just Q1 It's potentially moving, this variable. But what, what is this term? Yeah, so B is rotating in a constant. And we just talked about that little merry-go-round example. What is, what would happen if I'm looking at this point and it's rotating around? What kind of acceleration do I get in that negative bx direction? What was the word we used earlier? Centripetal or radial, right? So that that's what this is. That's p1s. You know, it has whatever's going on with this coordinate, but because it's moving around at common speed, you have to add in the centripetal. And they, they could cancel, you know, they could, uh, but that's the total acceleration in the Vx direction. This one, Q2, right, that's, that's just it moving up and down. And it can move up and down in any way it wants. What is that one? some acceleration in the BZ direction. 2 omega Q1 dot, Q1 dot. So it's pointing tangentially, essentially, to that. But we know omega is constant. Do you have tangential acceleration if omega is constant? No. So that's not the tangential acceleration. There's one more type of acceleration you've probably heard of. Coriolis. Coriolis acceleration. All right. 
So when you have points that can move in a rotating reference frame, there's this funny acceleration term that pops up. It's hard to sort of grasp you know, what it is. And, uh, and that's what you see there. It um, adds this component of acceleration in the negative BZ direction that is due to the fact that this Q1 can, can move. And, uh, and it's essentially this, you know, it adds to or subtracts from the tangential acceleration component or that, that same direction um, depending on if I move it out more, right? If I were to move this out a little more, I could get, I could get more tangential acceleration or less um, due to the radius changing. And that, that term captures that effect. Okay, so that just something to point out there. Those those are the components there, and that and that's going to pop up. And uh, you know, if you didn't take that into account, you wouldn't have the correct acceleration. Um, questions on this? No, I'm going to jump back to the notes um, here. Any questions on how to? how to do this, what this all means. What do you all not understand about SimPy and mechanics so far? Is it all straightforward or are there weird, un unusual things you're discovering or not, or not discovering? No. <laughs> what kind of solution are you asking about? Uh, the. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the sum of the forces, right, equals the time derivative of the angular linear momentum, right, of all the particles or things in the system. And then the sum of the moments is equal to the time derivative of the angular moment vector. Right? Well, both of these are potentially complex in the 3D. If you think about it in 2D, you know, this is, this is m times a and 2D i, I alpha, right? Um, we can get that point now. We can get A, and we can also get alpha. Right. So we're about at this. We're at this point. Right. So for simple systems, you can now write alpha in A. Well, we got some more things to write. We got to describe this and this, and this and this. And once you add those four more things, then we have either a differential, well, for, this, for simple systems, we have an ordinary differential equation, second order, right? Two of them here. And, you, and then you can solve, then you might want to solve that ordinary differential equation. So we're, we're going to get there, but um, we, got, we got some more things to learn about, okay? And, I, and we've showed you sort of the simple, right, this is the simplest view of the kinematics, right? You can now get an acceleration of a point on a moving body. And plug that in, and you can get the um, uh, angular acceleration. But uh, the next thing we're going to start talking about are constraints. And there's two types of constraints we're going to talk about. One is configuration constraints, right? So there's some things, configuration, that may limit or change what these values can be, okay? If I have some particular mechanical structure, um, for example, the mo a most common one is a four-bar linkage. Right, if I have four bars, right, and you can tell me, you know, I can say, find me the acceleration to this point, find me the acceleration to this point. Well, this point is 
zero. So if I, if I didn't connect it, I think now you could tell me what the acceleration at this point is. But when I connect these, that introduces a constraint. Constraint on the configuration, right? This point can't move anywhere it wants to. It has to stay right here. OK, so we're going to talk about how to deal with those. And then there's a second type of constraint that's a, a constraint on the velocity, the motion. So um, if I have a ball going down a track, maybe, it can only have a velocity that's tangent to the track. And that's the second type of constraint. So we're going to talk about those two constraints. And the constraints aren't trivial, and they're a little nasty. And that will, com that will help complete our ability to describe the kinematics, right? Completely describe A and alpha for any arbitrary thing. So before we get to M, I, M, uh, capital M and capital F, we also got to do the constraints. So we're a ways away. And, um, and one other note is uh, you can solve simple ordinary differential equations, right? If you, you know, we've all probably seen This system, right? If these are linear um, springs and dampers, <clears throat> you recall that m x double dot plus c x plus um, c x dot plus k x equals something maybe or. Well, I'll add a force here, too. Right? That's a second order ordinary difference equation. It's linear because these are linear coefficients in the time varying variables. If you look up here, this is a time varying variable. Is this a linear expression? It's not a linear expression. You can find the solutions to you know, these kind of ordinary differential equations, these linear ones. And if you recall, like one solution might be uh, right? That's, that's an analytical solution to this for certain values of m, c, and k. And you can do that analytically. Well, when you have nonlinear terms, um, ordinary differential equations are not trivial to solve analytically. And in fact, they may not be solvable. So just calling solve on it, the, the function in SymPy called solve, it tries to do an analytical solution. Okay? And, and we actually have, there's a module in SymPy called ordinary differential equations, and it will solve these kinds. Right? You can pass it in, this, this thing, and call solve. It's called like desolve for differential equation solve, called desolve on it, and it'll give you this. But if you try to pass in ordinary differential equation from this kind of stuff, that is still ordinary differential equations, but they're nonlinear, desolve will tell you to go to hell. It's not going to do it. I mean, I assume that there's numerical integrators. Yeah, so numerical solutions. But um, there is no solve command. So one, one key thing is that SymPy is a symbolic tool, and it does not do numerical stuff. Okay, but we'll we'll show that's where PyDi comes in. The we have a another package that's not part of SymPy because it deals with numerics, and that's why it's sort of separate. And this is part of SymPy, and we'll talk about that. And PyDi will help you solve these equations numerically. All right, and there's a lot of ways to do that. So good question. We've got uh, ten minutes. Um, Nine minutes. Let's see. Yeah, let me say this last thing. Let me get that from you. Okay, just as an intro to 
uh, what we'll talk about next time. Um, so this is uh, section 2.8 in the book, but um, there's also a concept. We talked about two points fixed on a rigid body, but there's also a useful theorem that if you have um, a point moving on the rigid body, so one point P moving on a rigid body B or reference frame B while B moves in reference frame A, we're going to let B bar be the point fixed in B where P is at this instant in time. That means that uh, B bar coincides with P presently. Okay? So, if I think about some reference frame A, and I'm going to have a point here, O, fixed in the body B. Let's get our potato back. And then you can imagine there's some you know, unit vectors here representing B. Well, just leave it like that. And that there's some point P that might be moving on a path, some, some arbitrary path on B. Now the key thing is that <clears throat> at a snapshot in time, at some time, uh, I don't want to say that, at uh, So we take, if we take a snapshot in time that we're going to define B bar as, as a point fixed on B that happens to be right where P is at that point in time. And recall that omega a, a B and A does not equal to zero in general and that the velocity of point OB in A does also not equal to zero, right? It's moving around in A. Right, B moving in A. Well, it turns out that, and we'll see why that's true, that the velocity of P in A equals the velocity of P in B plus the velocity of B bar in A. So this this is a little some you know it's an odd concept to think about. Um, you know why is the velocity of P in A different than the velocity of B bar in A. Any idea? you think about that. You can read what it says in the book, too. And we'll call it quits for today. Um,
Oke? Okay? Alrighty. Thank you much. Um, come see me to talk about your project. So you can